generations are, as we all know from our personal experience, incredibly relevant factors for understanding our own social and political attitudes. But as we all know from our own academic work as well, they are incredibly hard to capture. Therefore, many of my social science colleagues, they'll run away from the idea of using a generation in their model. Since it's so difficult to determine at what point a shared experience from one age group might translate into something that we could call generational consciousness. Not to mention the question whether a shared experience is enough anyway to make for a generation. But of course, as social scientists, we are not blind to generational dynamics, even if it's not the most intuitive explan explanatory variable. Um, that is somewhere positioned between the big structural explanations focusing on factors such as income inequality, literacy or geography, and those contentious moments of politics when protests or strikes unfold. But nevertheless, it's more of the domain of historians who with their diachronic perspectives have overall been a little braver um, trying to apply generational logics as an explanation for social, cultural or political phenomena. But since the end of communism has not yet led to an outpouring of historical scholarship, we find very little reflection on the end of communism as a generational phenomenon. Even though it is one of the most profound moments of political, cultural and social change of the last half century. And certainly the rigidity of Soviet institutions, be they political, discursive or administrative, they were in some tension with the dynamic social developments that mirrors this continuous generational replenishment. And therefore, I'm very pleased to have the opportunity today to discuss with you this somewhat underexplored territory. And for doing so, we've got three wonderful panelists, namely Professor Marcy Schor, Dr. Mikhail Anipkin, and Dr. Matthias Neumann. So Marcy is professor in the Department of History at Yale University and teaches modern European intellectual history, holds a PhD from Stanford University, and her research focuses on the intellectual history of the 20th and 21st century, Central and Eastern Europe. She's working with an impressive range of languages and has published numerous articles and essays. The one that I recommend everyone to read for today's talk is entitled The End of Communism as a Generational History, published on the occasion of the 20th anniversary of 1989. And her latest book, The Ukrainian Night, An Intimate History of Revolution, also engages with questions of generational belonging. Next, we've got Mikhail, who is a sociologist with a PhD from the University of Essex. He was professor of sociology and head of the Department of Sociology at Volgograd State University and is now living in the UK. In 1991, his father, Alexander Anipkin, was member of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. And in 1990, he became an MP to the Congress of People's Deputies. And Michal has just published a biography of his father that came out last September and is entitled, entitled Part Rabotnik. Mm. And lastly, we've got Matthias, who is senior lecturer in modern Russian history at the University of East Anglia in the UK. And he's also the president-elect of the British Association for Slavonic and East European Studies. Many of his publications are on the topic of youth and childhood in revolutionary Russia. And his book was probably one of the first things I read when I started my PhD a decade mm -hmm. ago, um, since it was on the Communist Youth League and the transformation of the Soviet Union after the revolution. And my name is Felix Kavacek. I'm a researcher at SOIS and working on questions of youth, memory, and migration. As many things in academia, today's event is a true team effort, and I'm very pleased that we were able to join forces with IGA in Leipzig, and that we are the opening event of this year's IGA Basis regional conference entitled Globalizing Eastern Europe, New Perspectives on Trans-Regional Entanglements that will run until Saturday. Special thanks is due to Lena Dallywater from the Leipzig um, Leibniz Science Campus Eastern Europe Global Area, and of course, the entire communications team at SOIS. So before we dive into the discussion, just a quick housekeeping note, as it's conventional, you're more than welcome to join our discussion. And for doing so, please just use the chat function 
and kind of write the questions. I'll address them to the appropriate panel member. And thank you very much for putting your questions in English. So everyone on the panel, except for myself, is old enough so that the end of communism could potentially qualify as your <laughs> defining political experience. Mm -hmm. So let's begin with you, Matthias and Mikhail, since you were both experiencing the end of communism from within. Mm -hmm. Matthias, I know that you were a very youthful and very keen political witness of the end of communism. Mm -hmm. Would you say that that was your defining generational experience? I mean, for me personally, it was certainly uh, 1989 and the end of communism was a profound formative experience. Um, and it really sped up my coming of age. I was born in 1977, so I was 11 years old in 1989, turned, had turned 12 by the time the Berlin Wall had come down. And I grew up in the city of Cottbus, which is about 100 kilometers south of Berlin, very close to the Polish border. And... Um, My first memory of 1989, kind of political memory, is actually the uh, Tiananmen Square massacre. And uh, I was watching the coverage of it like everyone else. Uh, we watched it also, also on, on Western telly, which, of course, most people in East Germany watched regularly, although we were, uh, of course, not talking about it at school. Um, and I saw the reaction of my parents to these events. Uh, we, of course, spoke about it and I made a kind of mistake uh, to defend the students in one of the regular classroom discussions we had at school uh, on you know, contemporary political events. And uh, I remember that the teacher in charge of that lesson, who was, of course, responsible for you know, maintaining the party line and the East German government very strongly supported the Chinese government, uh, reprimanded me in, in, in such a you know, verbally um, you know, aggressive way that I ended up crying for the rest of the class. Uh, this, is, this is my first uh, political memory of 1989. Um, then in summer 1989, my parents um, um, you know, took me on a holiday to, to Hungary camping. Each day we saw empty tents um, uh, in, a, in the morning on the campsite of, uh, you know, East uh, Germans who left during the night fleeing via the Hungarian-Austrian border to the West. Uh, that was never a question really for us because we had just too much family and friend um, back home. Um, but, you know, it certainly, um, you know, got me thinking. And of course, lots of things were already happening in that summer in, in, in autumn then. And I think this is really a, a pivotal moment on the 30th of October, 1989, the first Monday demonstration took place in the city of Cottbus. The intellectuals from the theater had called for it. Cottbus was fairly late to it. So there were already demonstrations in Leipzig and so on. Um, but it was still you know, very uncertain how, how many people would turn up, what would the police do? And I remember my parents telling me and my brother, you know, if the police moves in, if they start arresting people, you go back to your grandmother because they won't arrest children. So we went to this demonstration, really, I think with feelings, you know, quite anxious, but also very uh, excited. Uh, too many people turned up. And from that, you know, Monday onwards, we took part in pretty much all Monday demonstrations, which became a really profound experience, you know, to be part of this, uh, you know, this movement on, on, on the street. And I could see the transition from, of the slogans from, you know, we are the people calling for reform to, you know, to we are one people, essentially revolution, you know, let's unify. And by spring 1990, I was uh, handing out leaflets and flyers and putting up posters for um, the center-right coalition of parties called the Alliance Allianz für Deutschland, who were advocating uh, unification. And I was celebrating unification mm -hmm. um, later that year. So I can really see this transition in myself from being almost, you know, a fairly stalwart Tailman pioneer in spring mm -hmm. 1990, more or less uh, engaged, um, to um, you know, become some, becoming someone that was really politically. Uh, engaged. It was my political awakening. I can put it back to this experience that got me interested in history and politics and why I ended up studying it at the end. And my PhD brought me full circle back to the young communists uh, in the first communist country, um, you know, which, you know, I had once been a member, of course, of a communist children's organization. Thank you, Matthias. And over to you, Michal. How old 
how do you relate to what Matthias has just said and your own positioning as kind of potential generation perestroika, both on a biographical level and how you relate to society um, more widely in the changes of the time? Yes, um, I'm. Uh, not, uh, I was born in 1972 in October, so obviously I I, um, uh, I witnessed uh, all perestroika events and uh, in um, two capacities as a as a teenager um, uh, studying and finishing sc his school and as a son of a high-ranking party apparatchik mm -hmm. who was at the heart of the process and my father belonged to that younger generation of the um, party leaders of the uh, intermediate level who enthusiastically greeted perestroika and uh, uh, of course he wanted um, to uh, reform party, which we might talk about a little bit later. But um, I remember the main um, events that started taking place in Moscow. I mean, a um, uh, 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 um, uh, popular movement um, started uh, taking place, particularly in Moscow and other big cities, and in, in other big cities, after the 19th Party Conference in 1990, uh, in 1988. Uh, until 1988, nothing was happening virtually. Things were going on within the party, but at the popular level, nothing uh, uh, much happened. But starting from 1988, um, there was a growing, growing upsurge and uh, people would flock to the streets at every possible opportunity. And uh, specifically, 1989 was the um, a watershed, I would say, when the uh, Congress, first Congress of the People's Deputies of the Soviet Union congregated in Moscow in May in 1989, and we were stuck to the television and radio listening live what was going on at the sessions of that um, um, uh, uh, Congress. And uh, it was absolutely, uh, uh, c not just completely new, it was a total revelation for all of us, I'm sure, for Gorbachev himself. Uh, he didn't expect it, obviously. And uh, uh, in 1990, my father became a uh, first secretary of the Volgograd Communist Party Committee. To put it in a plain language, he became a party governor of the region, uh, uh, basically the governor of the region and became a member of the Central Committee of the Communist Party. And since then, and, 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 and an MP. And since then, I was sort of a, uh, uh, listening for uh, listening to everything that was uh, going on within the uh, uh, in depth of the structures of the power structures um, um, uh, from from inside of the uh, Soviet Union uh, party uh, authorities, and uh, of course uh, in 1991 there was a very funny situation. I was in Crimea uh, in August 1991, exactly uh, when Gorbachev was allegedly uh, kept isolated um, from his duties. Mm -hmm. And uh, I phoned my father. Um, I uh, watched on the television what was going on in Moscow and uh, uh, about the coup, you know, in Moscow in August, on the, on the 19th of August, 1991. And I uh, rushed to the telephone and phoned my father. And uh, my father asks me, look, son, tell me what's going on to Gorbachev. I was like, Papa, you're a member of the Central Committee and you're asking me what's going on to Gorbachev. He said, no, son, it's, 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 it's a total shambles here. And uh, he was rushing up to Moscow to the plenary session of the Central Committee. He demanded to summon that plenary session of the Central Committee to um, uh, uh, condemn those participating in the coup d'etat, but uh, his voice was not listened to. So he tried to stop uh, the party from being uh, abolished, but he didn't succeed, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So um, I remember when um, I came back from Crimea, back home uh, to Volgograd in August uh, the 23rd in 1991, mm -hmm and um, the uh, Volgograd Communist Party Regional Committee um, uh, was shut by the decree of Yeltsin, and my father was literally chucked out 
um, on the street. And uh, it was pretty hard time for me. So I was witnessing uh, those processes from, from a different position, from, mm. from, the, from the position which was quite different from probably uh, the one that the majority of people were looking mm. at, at the things. So this is my... Um, this is my recollection of the of the events, and 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 and, uh, yeah, and, yeah, and, and a lot of it I put in my book. Thank you. Yeah, these are two, well, age-wise, of course, very different experience, but also where you were positioned. But what we can, you know, pull out of it is certainly an extraordinarily early politicization um, at an extraordinary moment in history. And I wanted to give it over to you now, Marcy, the word, looking at it more from the outside, of course, you were, I presume, not in communist Europe in 1989, 1991. Um, What what is in your perspective the defining generational feature of those who were teenagers or older children, let's say, in the late stages of communism? How would you define them? Uh, Well, I'm exactly Mikhail's age, but I grew up on the other side of the world. I had completely opposite of experience. You know, I was in suburban Pennsylvania um, as the last generation growing up under the Cold War, Reagan era, evil empire, Iron Curtain. Um, The thing I think we both may have shared was a sense that this was going to go on forever. You know, I, I didn't know anything, I and mean, I was 17. I didn't know anything about communism in particular. I didn't come from a particularly intellectual background. You know, I didn't come from a house where you know people were reading great novels. I didn't come from a house where there was Tolstoy or Dostoevsky, or we were having these kinds of conversations at dinner. Um, so I had no particular intimate knowledge of what communism was about. I had a very primitive understanding, but I knew that it was bad, that it was evil. You know, that they didn't let people out of that country, that it was like a prison, and you know, that people were willing to go to jail to try to get out, um, and that the world was divided, and we were never going to see what was on the other side. I mean, I, at that point, had never been outside of the country. No one in my family had ever had a passport. Um, one thing people might not know about Americans is that most Americans have never had a passport. This is always shocking to people who come from countries where you weren't allowed to get a passport and they would take away your passport and to have a passport meant something. And the idea that most Americans don't bother to get one because why would you leave seems very strange. Um, But nonetheless, there was the sense that this was a place you were never gonna go and you were never gonna see and the world was always going to be divided. And these vague apocalyptic visions and all the movies that, well, one day we might throw a nuclear bomb on the Soviet Union and they'll throw one on us and that will be the end of the world. You know, and maybe you did some drills at school to prepare for the end of the world. But that seemed to be just, that would go on indefinitely. Nobody questioned it. So they, what was so dramatic for me in terms of coming of age about that experience was that something that was going to go on forever just ended from one day to the next. You know, like I remember where I was when I found out that the Berlin Wall fell. You know, not that I had ever been to Berlin, not that I knew anything about Berlin, but I understood that this wall was symbolic of this divided world that was going to be divided for my whole life. And either I would never get there or we would blow one another up. In any case, I would never see it. And suddenly it was opened. That's and very interesting. And there was interesting. something about yeah. that opening. I mean, the mm. opening was so seductive. Mm. And as you say, that it's deeply ingrained in, you know, still where the, how it felt to be that day. For me being quite a few years younger, I mean, 9-11 is certainly that moment yeah. for me where I still know exactly how I left the office, where I went and um, what friends I saw on that particular day. And I think we're approaching some of the conditions that help us to understand when a generational consciousness can emerge, what ingredients need to be need to be around. And I wanted to continue with you, Marcy, um, providing us a bit of kind of an intellectual academic definition of when do we know that there is a generation if we look around us, if we look at our source materials, how do I know that this is the conditions are there and we can talk about a generation with some confidence? Um, how would you define that term? Well, I should first of all say that I'm a historian, not a social scientist. So historians are storytellers. You know, um, we're not working in the same kind of rigid carrot 
categories. You know, I never felt compelled to come up with sociologically consistent definitions. Of course, I read Mannheim. You know, I, I, you know, I read all the people you're supposed to read. Um, but the idea that there were some particular rule that people could be included or excluded, I never felt particularly bound by. I had an intuition reading into biographical material, you know, that the moment, the age people were at certain dramatic historical events or moments of turning made a difference. Whether you were formed as a human being before the First World War or after the First World War. And biographically and historically, that evidence is all over the place. You know, there, there's a moment in 1918, 1919, where there's young Polish poets I write about in my first book, which is a, a generational biography, um, who were born around 1900. And so they come of age during the First World War. And there's a very famous line from a poem by Jan Lechon that in English, you know, I would translate, and in the spring, let me see spring, not Poland. You know, because this was somebody who came of age when there was no Poland, when all intellectuals were obsessed with carrying on the spirit of the nation in the absence of the state, where that was the overriding mandate. And suddenly they went through the First World War. There was a Poland, you know, and so they felt like, well, their task is something different. And you could feel the break. I mean, you could feel that they were thinking differently, that they were what they the moment at which they come into the world, the set of expectations, what was, how they were formed, you feel that intuitively in, in the archives. And I think in a way that for me felt much more persuasive in some sense than working with ethnic, racial, and national categories. I think it, it spoke to me more directly um, in part because of, of choices, whether or not you're old enough to make choices. You know, when you're, I mean, lots of us have kids, like, you know, my, I have an 11 year old son. So when you talked about your teacher making you cry when you were 11, my heart kind of broke because I'm constantly <laughs> thinking about him. Like, oh, 11 year old boy, he still seems so small to me. Um, they don't get to make the kinds of life forming decisions that you get to make when you're 18 or 19 or 20. You know, because most of the time, except in extreme circumstances, the parents are making those choices. So whether or not you were of an age to make the kind of adult choices that would determine your next path in life, or whether or not it was a few years too early for you, made a huge difference. Okay. Matthias, since you are the other historian on the panel, do you... Do you share that approach of the intuition in the archive and the age at a certain turning point? Or what would you say is important to add for your definition of generation? Well, I think, I mean, uh, starting with the question of age, I think age matters uh, immensely. I think, uh, and, and a difference of one or two years can completely change the way an individual is experiencing uh, a development or political situation and then work up that experience. Um, I think we can see that, uh, in, you know, in Russia in, in the war period and in terms of the Russian revolution, where we can, I, I can see it with myself because, you know, our history teacher when I was an A-level student, so always, and we talked about, you know, this was, you know, a few, five years later, so in 1997 or so, always told us that we were the last uh, age cohort that seemed to have a conscious um, memory of the pre-98, 89 period, you know, and, and kind of were able to understand some of the things that were happening and and, 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 and so on. So I think age really matters, although, I mean, the, the example of my, my own biography, I think I experienced it at a fairly young age. When I look at my own research, um, we're looking more at people who are you know, in their youth, um, as opposed to childhood, you know, who are starting to make their own decisions. I think that's very important to start forming their uh, identity um, and, uh, you know, making certain life choices. And I think if the, you know, if, if uh, and, and Manov, of course, argued that if you have this, you know, it's a generation or generational units, I mean, there's no such thing as degeneration, you know, there's also intersectionality, of course, and that's something that historians should look more into, I guess. Um, but if we have this, you know, 
events of um, you know rapid social change or you know revolutions, war, and so on. I mean, it's no it's no coincidence that the interwar period became the age of the politics of generation uh, across Europe. It's so present in the discourse in Germany, in France, you know, ev it's everywhere in Russia as well. Um, and of course, it's linked to World War One as a watershed moment. Um, and if you know a certain group of people experience um, um, a really important event, um, have this shared experience and then manage or, you know, somewhere arrange this experience in a particular way, understand it in a particular way, that can foster a sense of belonging and I think a sense of identity, you know, I think Mannheim used the word Schicksalsgesellschaft or, you know, Zusammenhörigkeitsgefühl in that context, that we can see this generational unit form. And I think it's really, th th there are, constructs to some extent of course but i think we can't we must not ignore them as historians because um generations are bound up with a long degree of social change you know there are um linked up with the distribution of you know economic resource and this never-ending competition for authority and legitimacy that we have in society i mean just in the current climate with covid we have so much discussion about uh, generational contracts and who's sacrificing what uh, and, 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 and so on. So since societies often organize themselves uh, and understands themselves in, 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 in terms of generation, uh, we, we must not ignore it. We must look at it and we must, must try to figure out how, uh, to what extent it's often a useful analytical tool to make us understand certain processes in a better way. But uh, um, but also how, of course, people themselves understood themselves to be part of this particular generational unit. And that can happen during, during the time of the event or very close to this important formative experience, but sometimes only a long time after. We see that, for example, in a way how 1968, of course, which is a, you know, a global event, is very differently understood in terms of a generational experience in different parts of Europe. You know, there are big differences between Germany, France and Britain. Right. So the self-understanding and the kind of external connotation of this is now a generation, um, the plurality, um, as you've as you've said, and the intersectionality that we that we want to look at. I think with World War One, the experience, and as you've both mentioned, of course, the kind of historical experience that someone goes through at a certain age, um, and then linked to that, I guess, also the expectation where this experience will will lead to. Um, that already gives us quite a few ideas um, that help us to, you know, know that we see a generation when there is one. Um, Michal, from a sociological perspective, what would you want to add to that question of the definition? Yes, uh, following Karl Mannheim's approach, we have to say that uh, from the sociological viewpoint, um, generations are shaped by uh, their shared uh, experience. Um, uh, major historical events, if you like, which um, happen when um, people uh, come of age, as quite rightly uh, was mentioned by Marcy, it's very important. For example, for my generation, it's perestroika, which shaped our um, common bond that, um, um, allow, that allows us to identify ourselves as the perestroika generation. And for example, for my father's generation, it's, I think, um, the uh, so-called Thor, you know, uh, uh, the Thor of the Khrushchev era, the liberalization, political and cultural liberalization of the late 1950s, early 60s, that was the shaping moment for his generation, and uh, so on and so forth. We can talk about it more in more detail. But uh, what's more important to uh, mention here is that the generational pace, the boundaries, the time scale for each generation differs. Um, for example, um, in turbulent period, in a turbulent period, the generational pace shrinks to five to three years, and then they become, they, uh, they comes a new generation. For example, um, for my own article about my generation, which I published in uh, 2018, which is called uh, The Generation of Superfluous People, mm -hmm. an anthropological portrait of the last Soviet generation. I um, uh, did uh, uh, in-depth interviews with uh, my generation, and I uh, came to a conclusion that uh, those between 
those born between 1965 and uh, 1969, which I regarded as my generation uh, in, a, in a broader context, they uh, are not exactly uh, my generation, although uh, um, statistically they belong to my generation. But when we talk about value, about the values, uh, for example, their attitude towards the Soviet Union is a bit different and so on and so forth. So I would uh, argue that um, during turbulent periods, the generational pace shrinks and um, uh, uh, narrows down from uh, 20 years as a normal pace for one generation at a normal period, in a normal period of time, um, to five or three years at a turbulent time. Okay, well, I'll let you all extrapolate what that means for the mm -hmm. current context and generational belonging. Um, but let's um, segue further and go to the um, beginning of the Soviet history, since Michal has already brought us back on the track mm -hmm. of empirics after the conceptual discussion. Um, I wanted to begin with you, Matthias, since you've been working on the early post-revolutionary Soviet Union. And have you talk a little bit about um, kind of that generation that brought about the revolution and created the Soviet Union and was then marching towards the, towards the communist future? I mean, how did actress young people at the time think about their own generational identity? And there has been um, the question from the audience that we mention kind of articles or books along the way, because people are probably interested in maybe following up what you what you are flagging in the discussion. So don't hesitate to do that. Okay, yeah, no, I mean, I already mentioned that, uh, you know, the interwar period was this age of the politics of generation. And uh, uh, we, we see, of course, World War One uh, giving notion to this, to, or this, this idea um, you know, the older generation sacrificed the young. There is a lot of loss, a loss of trust and respect for the older generation in post-war Europe. And uh, the idea of a wider, deep-rooted generational conflict in post-war societies exists in France and Germany and to some extent also in, 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 in Russia. And when we look at the left, it allowed the younger um, people involved, uh, you know, in the, in the socialist and communist movement to really claim... Uh, the role as the uncorrupted uh, revolutionary vanguard. Um, when we see, I mean, experienced the, the October Revolution or the, the February Revolution, the October Revolution as a, as a young person, um, if you were involved vaguely on the left in, 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 in one of those many youth groups, you know, was a, an incredibly exciting experience. You know, the street was the domain of young people. Uh, you know, I think revol comparing, um, looking at my own experience of 1989, a revolution is very colorful. You know, it, it turns life from the everyday grayness into color. You know, there are banners, there are flags, there, there are speeches, there are things, things are happening. Um, the Komsomol, when it was formed uh, in, in its first program, um, proclaimed that youth is the most active and revolutionary part of the working class, is the vanguard of the revolution. So the Komsomol and its members at that time, they really saw themselves as the vanguard of the vanguard. And while the Bolsheviks, of course, subscribed to a concept or, or idea of the continuity of generation, um, this was not the reality in the 1920s and 1930s. You know, the com in many respects, when we see the creation of you know communist youth organizations in Soviet Union, but also you know being exported to to the Eastern Bloc later on, it generationalized uh, the communist movement movement in this course of terms. And we see you know persistent tensions and conflicts often between the youth organization and the party organization. And certainly. In the 1920s, we see that in, 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 in the Soviet Union. Um, but, you know, the Bolsheviks have a very positive, um, you know, the, the, the discourse on youth is, in principle, very positive. Youth are the builders of communism. They will see it. Lenin ref uses the words generation 24 times or so mm -hmm. in, in, in his speech at the um, Third Komsomol Congress, you know, and really empowers young people, you know, you will build communism, you will see it. Um, but in terms of the shared experience of this first generation of Komsomol members, this was really, the, of course, the civil war revolution context. And, uh, you know, with all its violence and um, which formed a strong bond between these members, the, the veterans, um, and they expressed this, you know, this sense of, you know, shared experience through behavior, through language, fashion. Um, and, you know, we see this very, 
militant, very masculine culture emerging in the Komsomol, Mole. And the Komsomol, Mole in many respects becomes, because it's still a, a fairly autonomous uh, organization, it's still space for young people to express themselves independently and often in conflict with the state. You know, what young people thought was communist often clashed with what the, the party thought was communist. Um, you know, the Komsomol Mole became a place where generational conflict uh, could 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 uh, be nurtured, and we see that erupting and playing out in Stalin's revolution at the end of the 1930s. When you know Stalin, of course, you know the, with the with the socialist defendant allowed this to play out, um, but in the end, it left many young people who threw themselves readily into this um, you know revolution from above um, uh, disappointed. Mm. And the youth as vanguard discourse, I mean, is that complemented by a youth as threat language that we see in other European countries after after World War One and kind of ex more extremist youth movements dominating the kind of public Yeah, of course, we always have this uh, Janus faced, you know, mm -hmm. discourse on young people. I mean, youth are, you know, clearly, um, as I said, you know, they are the builders of communism. They are the future. Um, we see this very diff. Uh, you know, positive discourse adopted by the Bolsheviks themselves when they are they have in, before the revolution, they are a very young party uh, and the youth belongs to the future. They're fully subscribed to this, uh, um, this, this, this rhetoric. Um, but in the 1920s, of course, we also see a very, you know, negative discourse, you know, so you, you, youth being possibly, you know, youth being deviant and being able to undermine um, the system uh, being potentially dangerous. So of course, yeah, I mean, we, 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 we always see that. And I think we see that right through the, um, you know, the history of communism, you know, in, 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 in Eastern Europe as well, when, um, uh, you know, with the, with the, with the existence of the, or the, as the communist, you know, the, the, the youth program is being exported. We, on the one hand, we have all the propaganda and rhetoric about young people, very positive, empowering young people. But there's always this, this fear that young people could divert um, from the line. And we see that in 1968, of course, playing out in, in, in Eastern Europe as well, where mm -hmm. clearly young people are seen as a threat. Yeah. Okay, then let's move one watershed on, so to speak, um, <laughs> over to you, Michael, and the experience of kind of World War II on generational belonging. I mean, what's the impact of that? Of course, huge event and we can, and books have been written on that. But if you were to extract a few key messages, um, World War II and generational belonging, how would you characterize that? Yes, I'd like to start by referring to what Matthias has already said. And, so, and it's very important to um, underline the fact that in the Soviet Union that uh, there had never been a tradition of natural um, 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 generational rotation or uh, uh, rejuvenation of uh, uh, generational presence in key positions. So, in other words, generations did not uh, change uh, in key positions, in power positions, naturally. They had to be something that would push them uh, off these positions, and in 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 the Soviet case, uh, it was the start. It was Stalin's purges, which acted uh, uh, as a kind of a, as a means of uh, uh, generational rejuvenation. Although Stalin probably did not uh, mean that to be the case, and uh, if uh, if we talk about um, uh, the war, then we have to mention uh, two so-called war generations in the Soviet Union uh, in the context of our talk. The first, which is roughly the Brezhnev generation and around that age, had been fast promoted to the top positions, mainly because of Stalin's pre-war massive purges, as I said, and of course, because of the casualties that the Soviet Union had during the war. And uh, that uh, um, um, created a completely um, uh, stable nomenclatura um, after Brezhnev came to power in 1964, after the overthrew Khrushchev, and uh, this generation held office for the next 20 years, and sometimes even more, um, not giving way to the younger generation, let's say the generation um, of their children born round about the late 1930s and early 40s. And this, the second war generation, to be more precise, the generation of children of the war, 
which then became the so-called the generation of the Thor, uh, as I said earlier, or Shestidisatniki in Russian. Mm. This generation was overlooked by the Brezhnev generation or neglected or left behind, whatever, and was kept in less significant positions almost until 1989-1990. Even with Gorbachev becoming the general secretary, that situation didn't change significantly. Uh, you know, we all remember what he did when he became Soviet leader in 1985. Of course, he points the 76-year-old Gramika as chairman of the Supreme Soviet of the USSR, formerly the uh, president of the USSR. Of course, the general secretary had all the power, but um, uh, formally speaking, uh, a chairman of the Supreme Soviet of the USSR was the head of state. So he appoints Gramika, aged 76, that war generation, that Brezhnev generation, uh, to the key position. So that snowball was still hating the country um, almost until the end of the Soviet Union, until round about 1990. And uh, these problems were mounting and uh, they resulted in the internal revolt, let's put it this way, demographical internal revolt within the party ruling, ruling structures, uh, like my father's generation, they uh, took over the key positions in uh, uh, mainly 1990. In 1990, the massive process of rejuvenation in the key positions in the regions started and completed. And that came together with the upsurge of anti-establishment movement in the uh, big cities in the Soviet Union, and that actually smashed the Soviet Union, uh, 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 swept away the Soviet Union, the CPSU, the, the party, and the state itself. But the, the roots are in the fact that they had never been a, 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 a tradition of natural um, uh, generational rotation in the Soviet Union, nor is it there in contemporary Russia either. And we could talk about it a, a little bit later. Okay, well, that um, allows me then to pass the word on to Marcy to probably you have some words to say on, on the two points that were raised already on mm -hmm. post-revolutionary and post-war II. But I also wanted to ask you specifically about 1968 and the experience in Central and Eastern Europe and the Prague Spring, because that beyond doubt was the defining generational moment for many of the young people at the time. And if you could develop on that point for us um, a little bit, that would be great. Okay, well, well, now I have lots of notes also in response to what Matthias and Mikhail said. Um, so maybe just quickly, I mean, first, I think this, the issue of responsibility, were you at an age where you bear responsibility for your actions at a certain moment? I think at all of these watersheds were very critical. You know, were you at an age that when, you know, when we hear about the Gnade der Späten Geburt, you know, in, in Germany, the, the, the grace of a late birth, you know, it's about do you bear responsibility for what happened during the war? And I think that's true at every kind of these watershed moments. You know, Wisława Szymborska wrote once, Tilibiami Osobiana Elena Spravdona, we only know ourselves insofar as we've been tested. You know, and you, the 11 year olds are not bearing responsibility, but the 18 year olds already are. And one of the things you see at the end of communism in Poland, according to a, a 2007 lustration law, you know, you, you have to go through lustration if you're in certain professions, if you were born on or before August 1st, 1972. If you were born after 1972, you're exempt because you were not responsible. If you were before, born before that, you are responsible. So you actually draw a line on one particular day. Um, and then on the point that Mikhail made, I, I also wanna emphasize that, that you see as a historian, just how quickly the generational turnover is at these moments of great historical drama, because whether you were 15 or 18 in 1939 made a big difference. Whether you were you know, 17 or 20 in 1968 makes a big difference. You know, were you bearing responsibility or not? And in the Soviet case, that's connected with you know, a, a movement, an ideology, a social engineering experiment that was hyper self-conscious about temporality. 
you know, Marxism comes into being with this, you know, Hegelian teleology. And then Lenin's most profound revision of Marxism was essentially about rushing history. And the whole idea of the party and the vanguard was essentially that history could be rushed, that you could literally speed it up. So this idea of time speeding up, could you rush time? Could you get to the future faster? Was so embedded in central in Marxism and in Bolshevism and in Leninism in particular from the beginning. I mean, you feel that if you read, you know, John Reed's 10 Days That Shook the World, you know, or Bulgakov's White Guard. And that, that's a novel that's taking place in basically 24 hours. And the whole world turns around several times, you know, in the course of those 24 hours in Kiev. You know, John Reed's book is, you know, set 10 days, you know, mostly in Petersburg, you know, and you've just jumped ahead, you know, decades, you know, if, if not a century. You know, and so it, it's inevitable that bound up with that, you're going to get generational cleavages in really, really quick periods of time. Um, and I think that relates to the issue of 1968, which the, the, the very interesting comparison for me has to do with Poland and Germany, because in both cases, you get a very kind of Oedipal rebellion effect where children are revolting against the silences of their parents. And there's a sense that we were not responsible, we were born afterwards, but the silences of the parents about their complicity in Nazism in one case, and the silences of the parents for their complicity in Stalinism in the other case. You know, and this revolt against the silences of the parents. Um, and why didn't you tell me? You know, the leaders of 1968, the student leaders of 1968 in Poland were disproportionately the children of of Polish Stalinist, you know, of, of Polish communists who were to some extent Polish Jewish communists who were active in building Stalinism in Poland. And their children were going to rise up against the system that their parents had built. Yeah, that's really fascinating. The, this very specific generational program mm -hmm. that is embedded in the Soviet Union and the entire ideology of communism as you say, due to this ambition to move forward, and then this tomorrow, of course, never comes. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's always this this next step that is mm -hmm. something that is to be given to the future generation. So there's this dynamic of looking to the future and making sacrifices in the present um, for for our children. But as we know, um, you know that salvation was was not experienced. So that's um, it's interesting how it is embedded in in the project. Mm -hmm of communism itself um and I think if topic, I do, yeah, Matthias, if please, I, if yeah. I can just add to that i think i mean the interesting thing here is that when we look at the 1980s i think that we look at the um the the you know the the the, the activists and we're looking at uh, the party members and uh, they all uh, at, in the late 1980s, I think there was no belief any longer in mm. this great move forward. You know, the, the 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 fate was lost in the, you know, supremacy of the, you know, of the system. You know, Gorbachev would not have said, you could not imagine Gorbachev saying, you know, like Khrushchev said, we will crush you. Mm -hmm. You know, all this optimism, mm -hmm. all this uh, belief in the superiority of the system that we saw, you know, with the space race, with, you know, these great mm -hmm. achievements, it had gone. And, you know, well, the, the vast majority of ordinary Soviet people, and I think, you know, I can see that myself, my parents and so on, you know, we all, some, you know, we all, you know, we all had to interact and, and engage with the regime. That was non-negotiable, but the quality and the level on how you engaged with the regime, that was, that was, that was negotiable. Of course, you needed to engage with the regime and you did. There was this, all this mass participation and we all know these performative acts and rituals and things because you wanted to access you know, the benefits of the system and you wanted to get on and make your own life, you know, and have a life and people did it. You know, Alexei Yoshak has written about it, of course, in, term, in his book on the last Soviet generation. Uh, people, but, but the interesting thing is it's also that the ruling class lost their faith. You know, mm -hmm. we look at East Germany in 90, I think 87, more than 400 party members did not return from business trips to West Germany. Mm -hmm. One year later, it was more than double that. Mm -hmm. And 1,300 or so had 
party members had applied for exit visas. So I think we see this, um, you know, we, we see this loss of faith in the regime um, amongst the ruling class. And of course, the vast majority of people, which are probably apathetic conformists, they engage with it on a very superficial, um, you know, and selected level to access the benefits of the regime. I mean, these are welfare dictatorships, you know, they provide education, they provide healthcare, provide all <laughs> kinds of things. And in order to, to, to access it, one needed to do certain things because no one, no one, uh, neither the, the party members nor the ordinary East Germans, I would say, were thinking that it would end. You know, that was also not the case. But the fate that, that anything, there was this great movement coming any longer, it, it was gone, I think. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> may I yeah, uh, <clears throat> yeah, sure. add to that? Yes. Well, as for the um, uh, Soviet transformation of the, I mean, in the late uh, Perestroika time, the transformation of the party, um, there was a, uh, um, an important ideological discussion from within the party. And uh, uh, I wouldn't say that uh, there was a, a disappearance of a faith in the uh, certain ideological uh, stances. I think um, uh, starting uh, around about that 19th party conference um, of 1988, there had been a discussion which launched uh, launched an ideological discussion on all um, uh, in all directions about the party future and about the future of the system, and it was not hopeless from my perspective. It was not hopeless in the least, and uh, um, I think it was not just my perspective. My father believed in um, reforming the party, and uh, he was uh, advocating for removal of the clause six which ensured the ruling uh, role of the Communist Party from the Constitution. Why? Because he believed that removing that uh, sooner or later that clause uh, had to be removed. And uh, it is best if we do it ourselves, mm -hmm. he said to me, mm -hmm. rather than the people from the street uh, pushed us mm -hmm. in that direction. So, and they initiated that. He, I mean, they, there were different groups within the party in the top level. They were um, so-called, so, uh, um, uh, uh, um, uh, followers of the parliamentary um, uh, uh, development of the party, so turning the party into the parliamentary party, and that was Gorbachev, that was my father and his colleagues, um, which uh, who saw the party as a parliamentary party. They were conservatives, which obviously wanted to uh, leave things intact, and they were, uh, let's say, uh, uh, so-called so progressivists we, uh, who just wanted to um, uh, abolish the party in its form and uh, make something complete, create something completely different. And uh, the uh, uh, Congress, which never uh, took place, uh, the 29th Congress of the Communist Party, which had to adopt a new program of the Communist Party was supposed to be held in autumn 1991. But incident, uh, ironically speaking, <clears throat> we received the uh, party magazine Communist with the new um, project of the program of the party program when the party was already uh, abolished by Yeltsin. <laughs> that's 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 the grimace of history. But <laughs> what I'm trying to say that even even the um, public opinion polls uh, um, uh, undertaken by um, uh, relatively, not relatively, by independent institutions showed quite a, a, a massive support uh, for the party. For example, just before the 28th Congress of the party, which uh, uh, took place in July 1990, Levada Center, uh, to <clears throat> our audience, I'd like to just um, 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 briefly say that Livada, the Levada Center was and now is an independent uh, from the uh, state system polling uh, agency. So they uh, monitor the public opinion um, just before the Congress in July 1990, um, and uh, up to 50% uh, of the um, respondents uh, still uh, said that they uh, uh, had some kind of trust in the party. So they had never been a massive disbelief uh, in the party in the Soviet Union. And we have to bear in mind that the Russian electorate is a uh, very, very conservative. So there had never been um, um, uh, a situation when the party lost its, ab absolutely lost its um, uh, credibility 
in society, never, ever. And uh, the, 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 the statistics simply show that. I mean, the public opinion polls. And uh, yes, I think it's just to, uh, to conclude, it's important to uh, mention this important thing that in the Soviet Union, um, they, uh, uh, there was a discussion and the party never lost its entire credibility like it was the case in the DDR. Okay, right. Now, I want to move on to a new topic. Um, and as we all know, Time magazine put Mikhail Gorbachev twice on its cover as the man of the year. And I guess it's beyond doubt that the end of communism was a global event. And I wanted to bring that to you, first of all, Marcy, since you are our global observer. Um, <laughs> um, and I wanted to ask you what the impact of the end of communism in your opinion, was on the young generation beyond, kind of on the global young generation. You can focus, of course, on the US, but mm. kind of as a generational rupture for those who were not participating, as Matthias and Michael mm. were um, actors in in the end of communism. Um, how would you how what would you make of of that importance, if there is any at all? He was certainly hugely important. I mean, at least for me, I don't, you know, I certainly wouldn't want to. I, I wouldn't want to assume that I have a global perspective, but growing up in suburban Pennsylvania, Gorbachev was the hero, you know, for bringing this to an end without a nuclear war. You know, this sense that sooner or later there was going to be a nuclear war, there would be the apocalypse, the world would end. That was somehow always lingering, you know, perhaps from the perspective of these horror films. And Gorbachev came on the scene and it's not, Certainly not that people my age had any sophisticated sense of what was happening within the Soviet, the Soviet Union or the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. But Gorbachev as a figure who was out there not going to throw a nuclear bomb on us, you know, was a great hero. I mean, and I remember the moment I remember the moment when he repealed the Brezhnev Doctrine. And I was, I mean, I was in high school and people were talking about, well, now it's the Sinatra doctrine that, you know, I'll do it my way. <laughs> I'll do it my way. You'll do it your way. I don't even know if people still talk about it as a Sinatra doctrine, but that was this, the sense of, okay, nothing like the world isn't going to end. There was yeah, what this is feeling left that, that it was not going to end of the Sinatra doctrine. No, of the Gorbachev mm -hmm. as a hero. Um, I think everyone has kind of forgotten about him. I mean, what it was very quickly replaced by, you know, by the time I was starting university was a feeling of the end of history. I mean, Francis Fukuyama's idea that there was the end of history, that you know, the replacement of basically one Hegelian narrative with another Hegelian narrative. Miłosz talks about the Hegelian bite. Well, we had our own Hegelian bite, you know, and perhaps we had this on both sides of the Atlantic. I, I was moderating a seminar with the Ukrainian novelist Yuri Andrakovich yesterday. And he was like, we were all over Fukuyama in Ukraine in the 1990s, um, post-Soviet Ukraine, that you know, everyone now was you know, proceeding inexorably towards liberal democracy, part of this utopian capitalist package in which nobody was really disentangling democracy from liberalism, from the free market or any of these things. And we were all gonna live happily ever after. And that was, you know, that was what kind of set the mood. We were all going to live happily ever after. Now, of course, you know, that realizing that there's no happily ever after and there's no promised land, that was in sense, you know, my longer coming of age. Um, and you can argue that in America that ended on September 11th. I mean, you, it's interesting that you mentioned that you, know, you remember where you were when you heard about September 11th. I remember where I was when I heard that the Berlin Wall fell, even though, I had no idea really, you know, what, where Berlin was. I was in Manhattan on September 11th, you know? And of course I remember where I was when I heard about September 11th and I, sure. you know, mm -hmm. stared up into the ceiling in abject terror for a very long time, but it wasn't formative in the same way. It didn't, yeah. I was already shaped as a person. It didn't change my life the way 1989 changed my life and set me off on a different path. Yeah, that is very was, interesting. And I have never, I was never in New York, of course, by 2001. I mean, that was, I didn't even put my foot <laughs> on American soil, but nevertheless, yeah. Um, okay, so the, here we go. Why Gorbachev then was um, kind of replaced as a hero mm -hmm. by the end of history narrative. That's, that's interesting. Um, and Matthias, over to you for 
maybe the European context, I mean, other, um, other West European countries, that same question. Yeah, I mean, obviously, it, it's not something that I have uh, researched in any way. And obviously, I experienced it from inside the GDR. Mm -hmm. But from talking to, um, you know, colleagues and friends, and particularly people who were engaged on the on the left in, in Britain, um, 1989, 1991 were the end point, the sad end point to something. The much more uh, decisive date was 1985. That was the big, I mean, Gorbachev, Perestroika, which created an awful lot of excitement about um, you know, opening up of the Soviet Union, some reform, some uh, you know, pursuit of uh, you know, a democratization of 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 socialism. Um, so there were these high hopes, and we see, of course, also, and that's something that I I'm, I'm I have more um, knowledge about because I'm researching uh, um, cultural diplomacy and people's exchanges in the in the late Cold War. Currently, we see this explosion of of contacts, you know, people to people diplomacy, exchange programs, tourism, of course. So there are lots of these things happening, and we see um, even in the you know we see in the United States. I mean, Marcy was talking about you know the, the kind of very strong. Um, pictures of, of, of about the Soviet Union and, and, and this communist totalitarian regime and so on. But we see in the in the 80s, in the late 80s, in particular, we see a change in attitudes and public opinion towards the Soviet Union. Because Gorbachev, of course, started perestroika, but also people were actually meeting ordinary Russians um, or were seeing many more reports about these exchanges and so on. So we, we and, and David Fogelsong has written about it a couple of articles uh, recently. 1989 then, of course, uh, 89, particularly the, the collapse um, uh, or the, the revolutions in, 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 in Central Eastern Europe and then German unification were for the British left in particular, uh, I think really um, um, decisive moments where were, you know, an immense uh, loss, you know, for, um, you know, that there, there was no hope any longer for it, democratization of socialism. And by the time the Soviet Union collapsed, which I think at, at that point, many people saw, of course, the, the disintegration happening before their eyes. Um, this was just the sad end point. And, and actually things moved on very quickly with, you know, the, the first Iraq war, where you have people you know, demonstrated against it. When I talk about a British left in particular, we have to see the broader context of the peace movement and all this. So if, if we look at the global, uh, in, in Europe and also in the States, the peace movement, which was much broader and engaged a much wider group of people, um, you know, they were looking at Gorbachev as someone that would change things, you know, de-escalation, arms reductions. What 1991 then, the collapse produced was a, a Europe where the, you know, the hope for a non-block system was gone and the end of history was just bringing about more conflict and more, you know, the conflict moved to different areas of the world, but it, it, it was not what people had hoped for mm. on the left, certainly. Okay, so let's move then to the present. Um, and that also allows me to bring in a question from the audience. Um, someone asks whether generations still exist or, um, is it just kind of a, a blurred and a mess that kind of is unfolding continuously? Mm. Or in other words, is it simply very hard to identify in, in mm. a generation as events unfold? And I would like to give it to you, Micha, um, in particular with a focus also on contemporary Russia, where we've got something yeah. that one could identify as a very yes. strong generational program. Yes. Um, so how would you see um, generational dynamics in, in today's Russia, Micha? Yes. Uh, answering that question, whether generations still exist, of course, by all means, <laughs> generations do exist. <laughs> and uh, I think uh, in Russia, specifically in Russia, and uh, I would uh, argue that in any, in an, any totalitarian country, generational um, uh, dimension is probably more important mm. than any dimension or equally important as, for example, um, economic or cultural or social dimension, um, because uh, totalitarian, or let's take the Soviet Union as an example, um, um, uh, generational differences uh, can be illustrated uh, on a loaf of bread. You take a loaf of bread and you can uh, break it with your both hands 
or slice it. <laughs> when you slice it, that, gener that generates a very clear cut mm -hmm. between the two pieces. So <laughs> this is the Soviet Union case. And when you break it, the differences between the two pieces are less obvious. They are sort of uneven, more uneven. So you never know when the first, the left piece part of the loaf is still that left part of the, belongs to the left part of the loaf, or it is, a, a, or it's a part of the right part of the loaf, et cetera, et cetera. You know what I mean? So in a normal, let's say in a normal society, the uh, transition, generational transition is more blurred, less obvious. Whereas in um, uh, totalitarian societies, life is shaped by the political uh, events, by um, decisions of the Politburo, of the political recessions, um, um, party congresses and things like that. This is why the generational context, when we um, uh, uh, study the history of the Soviet Union of the 20th century and even contemporary Russia is, uh, I think, an, an extremely important um, uh, scope to look at and the lens. Well, the so current generation, yes, the, the current generational situation in Russia is, first of all, uh, the continuation and the result of what happened in 1991 with the collapse of the Soviet Union. I'm talking about the fact that the uh, Thor generation, my father's generation, was swept away and the beneficiary of that counter perestroika, as I call it, revolution, became the baby boomers generation uh, born in, in the 1950s, which is Putin's generation, which is still in power. The uncanny grimace of history is that what Russia is going through now repeats the late Soviet Union's astoy, staff stagnation. Mm -hmm. But this repetition is even worse because it affects not just one generation feeling resentful at being overlooked and kept in less significant positions, uh, uh, as was the case in the 1970s and through the 1980s. The current situation affects three generations and not just those in the power structures as it was the case uh, uh, earlier as i said we are talking about my generation which i call the last soviet generation mm -hmm. then there is our children's generation and third some representatives of the children of putin's generation who uh, uh, feel all of them feel resentful although in the latter case, it is more complicated. Putin's generation, which is maintaining its grip on power, is gradually promoting its children to the key positions, but not as fast as the youngsters would like. Mm -hmm. So um, it's all these pro uh, this generational context, I, I think is absolutely uh, uh, important to uh, understand what's going on um, in, uh, in Russia at the moment, and just uh, I'm finishing. I think that um, the fact that the uh, that uh, certain generations were not given the opportunity to uh, fulfill its generational program, like my father's generation, for example, or my generation, or obviously the generation of our children is not go is not going to be uh, uh, allowed to do that. It um, uh, comes to the fact that this society starts uh, accumulating these problems and at the first glance we think, oh, it's just a political problem or an economic problem or some other problem. But in fact, in my opinion, it's the result uh, of, the, of, of that not giving uh, the previous generations and the uh, existing generations to fulfill their generational program, which is the Russian case. Yeah, that's a very, very profound statement. Um, thank you. And Marcy, over to you, since I mean, you've written an entire book on, on Ukraine and the question on, of generations is also touched on, on in there. Um, how would you compare that situation in Ukraine and generational belonging um, with what Michal has just been saying about Russian case? Mm. Well, first I should say that I, I don't see that generations will ever go away as long as time moves. You know, we understand ourselves through time. You know, I, I don't see that as something that is, I, I, our self-understanding through time, I don't think is something that will go away as a result of historical circumstance. 
you know, one of the things that that struck me, I mean, as a historian and as a historian who's been interested in, you know, the history of communism as something that could potentially be implotted as a history of Oedipal rebellion, each generation in its turn rising up against the fathers. And there was the moment on the Maidan at the end of November, 2013, you know, the first nine, 10 days when people were demonstrating on the Maidan against Yanukovych's 11th hour decision not to sign the EU association agreement. They were mostly, not exclusively, but overwhelmingly young people, students and people of student age who saw their future stolen from them, people for whom the stakes of whether or not Europe was going to be open to them were the greatest precisely because they were at that age. You know, their slogan was Ukraine is Europe. They weren't interested in language politics, ethnic politics, political parties. They wanted Europe to be open to them. November 30th, you know, Yanukovych decides to send out his riot police to brutally beat up the students. Presumably, he thinks like that's going to be the end of it. You know, this kind of act of violence, which nobody had been used to, which hadn't been used on a mass scale in post-Soviet Ukraine, was going to cause the parents to pull their kids off the streets, which was perhaps not, you know, an unrealistic expectation. You know, and 24 hours later, you have close to a million people on the streets of Kiev because the parents, instead of pulling their kids off the street, decide to join them there. And watching that as a historian, this moment of a kind of Aufhebung of Oedipal rebellion was extraordinary. You know, and then the slogan rather than Ukraine is Europe was we will not permit them to beat our children, which I noticed was being said even by people who didn't have children themselves. You know, but that moment of overcoming that generational boundary, you know, that was when things changed. That was when it, you know, that was when it became a revolution from a protest movement. Yeah, I mean, at and, that point, it turns from a youth movement into a well, revolution when once it becomes cross-generational. I, I talked mm -hmm. to one student, I mean, literally a high school student at that time who was mm -hmm. on the square and gets beaten up and his shoulder battered in on November 30th. He was 16 at the time. He wasn't even at university. He was literally a kid. He was living with his, his mother. And I said, your mother must have been very upset that she let you go back. And he said, my mother, my mother was making Molotov cocktails on Hrushevskova Street. Um, and, it, and I noticed also when I talked to people, you know, later for that book afterwards about the Maidan, people who are my age were starting to say things like, well, this was my third revolution. And people who are, this was my second revolution. Well, I wasn't old enough in 1989 and 1991, but I was there for the Orange Revolution in 2004, or this is my first revolution. So people actually started talking about, it's my first revolution, my second revolution, my third revolution, and defining themselves you know, by what number of revolution this was. Well, that's fascinating. Links back to the point you made earlier about the few, the few years of difference in age you have a, at a yeah. particular turning point could mean that, well, it's only your second rather than your third, mm -hmm. even you're only three years mm -hmm. younger than maybe your best friend for mm -hmm. whom it's already the third revolution. Um, we are nearing the end, but I wanted to give the word to Matthias as well to come in on that question on um, today's generational dynamics. And you can either oh. bring in your, your current research or jump in. Yeah, I think I will, I will span from the last uh, Soviet generation to, to, to the contemporary times. I think bring back to the last Soviet generation. I think it's very important, of course, when we look at, you know, communist societies in the East, that people's sense of themselves and their interest did not arise independently uh, from the, of the system that they lived in. You know, as I mentioned, they had to engage with it. That was non-negotiable. And this constant engagement and rituals and so on. But also they were shaped by, you know, socialization, kindergarten, school, the communist youth league. And I think many of those, that last generation didn't actually realize how much they were shaped by that experience until long after. And we have some sociological uh, research on, on East Germany where we see that, you know, East Germans growing up being socialized in East, uh, in, in East Germany, you know, have very different value systems um, than, than, than West Germans of the same generation. So clearly, you know, that, that, that um, 
had a had a profound uh, impact. But coming to contemporary times, I mean, I'm really not an expert on that. And uh, but I, I, it struck me how things have changed. You know, we have when we look. Um, 10 years back or so we see of course you know a, a youth program with with nashi and uh, you know often uh, you know called the putin youth very you know mobilization very politicized you know nashi has been dissolved i think finally in 2019 and what i see from my own research which is on um you know, American kids who went during the Cold War to the Soviet Union to mm -hmm. attend the international session of the Arctic Pioneer Camp. Um, and I had the, I was lucky enough to to accompany an American delegation in summer 2019 to, to, to the international session. And what I saw, what, what struck me really, you know, taking, you know, being in the camp and, 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 um, accompanying the, the kids and seeing what they were doing and so on was the, the, the absence of politics in that camp. Of course, the camp itself is highly political. It serves a purpose like the brand new airport, like the bridge. You know, it's about reclaiming, you know, Crimea uh, to Russia and bringing it back in the, in, into the motherland. But inside the camp, there was a, a profound absence of politics. There were a few mur murals here and there and, and, and some very, very low key events. One of them was the uh, Soviet um, Samantha Smith, uh, Katya Blucheva, I think, Blucheva, you know, was, yeah, right. yeah she was right. giving a, a talk because she was to, to a small num number of, of kids there because they had won their place to attack by being part of a competition that she was overseeing. But, you know, in Soviet times, she would have given that speech in the stadium to everyone who was there. You know, that was not advertised. We sneaked in because we got information from someone from the press office and they were not happy about that. Um, but more importantly, it is the last Soviet generation that sends their kids there. And when what what was really surprising, which I didn't expect, was accompanied this American delegation, you know, of this American delegation, which I think were 11 or 12 kids, only one of them had no Russian heritage. Mm -hmm. um, they were all... They all had Russian mothers or fathers. Only one needed the visa. And this one girl was only in that group because I had interviewed her father who went in the early 1980s as part of one of the delegations that are researching. And I mentioned that that there was a delegation going and he wanted to have to relive this profound experience <laughs> that he had. Mm -hmm. And uh, arriving in the camp, it's, you know, the, the, the MFA in, in Crimea, Russia's MFA, they tweeted, you know, at that time, um, 19 July 2019, we are different, we are equal. 3,470 children from 76 countries and 79 regions of Russia gathered at the stadium of the International Children's Camp, attacked to, great, to greet each other and open the eighth shift of 2019. You know, 76 uh, countries. Yeah, there were a few uh, small delegations there, you know, Chinese, uh, you know, piano players, amazing, uh, the kids. But the vast majority of those kids were all of Russian heritage. It, you know, in Soviet times, this camp was used in the, for the international session for the Soviet Union to reach out to the world, to bring it to, to the Soviet Union and to showcase Russia as a peace-loving country. Now this international session is, is, is an opportunity to reconnect with the Russian diaspora. There were no interpreters. You know, Russian is the only yeah. spoken language in the camp. And that... Uh, that the only the, the, the American <laughs> girl that didn't have any <laughs> Russian heritage or no language right. had a really, really tough time. Um, well. But I interviewed, I spoke to some of the parents uh, who sent their children, the American, you know, American Russian parents. And, you know, they were my age, maybe a bit older. This was the last Soviet generation who are quite happily embracing that. And this is reconnect. I think this is a final point I want to make is the the one thing that, the last Soviet generation or, you know, pre or other people that have grown up in the Soviet Union, older ones look back in, we, we certainly with a lot of positive memories is childhood. And then mm -hmm. the myth of the sacred, you know, protected, sheltered Russian uh, Soviet childhood became even, you know, of the happy child became a bit bigger after 1991, of course, after with all the turmoil than, than in, in, in Soviet times. And I think, Seeing this Russian, uh, the, the last Soviet generation sending the children to a camp like attack is kind of reconnecting with this, um, you know, Soviet experience that was um, 
you know, this was a state that invested into education, that cared about its children. Um, but it is very depoliticized, I think. Yeah, that's really interesting, Matthias. So it's the hyper political end of communism that, in memory of the Soviet childhood becomes depoliticized mm -hmm. and is then transmitted to the children of those who were <laughs> politicized by the end of communism <laughs> and who now, at least those that are included in your study, are kind of creating a transnational post-Soviet generation that still shares a certain romanticism of, of today's Russia. So that's a nice, um, a nice way to conclude it. Thank you very much to, to all three of you and thank you ev everyone for listening. Um, I just wanted to also say that, so this event is part of um, the 30 post-Soviet years that we organize here at SOIS in cooperation with a couple of institutes, namely the Kerber Foundation, the German Association for East European Studies, the German Historical Institute in Moscow, the Friedrich Ebert Foundation in Russia, and Memorial International. There will be a couple of more events to come throughout um, the entire year to revisit the watershed year of 1991. And once again, many thanks to Professor Marcy Shore, Dr. Michaela Nipkin, and Dr. Matthias Neumann for your involvement um, and your input today. Um, we all very much appreciated it. And we look forward to hopefully seeing you at some point in Berlin. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.